Don't give up when someone denies you your right. Thank you very much. This is this month's legislative update. Continue pushing it a step forward. We two bodies are all not alike. Yeah. Right? If you give people the chance and the encouragement and some supports, amazing things can happen. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to this edition of Disability Viewpoints. My guest host today is Armani Cruzen. And Armani, who is your guest going to be today? Today I'm interviewing Anita Cameron. She's the director of Minority Outreach for Not Dead Yet and an activist and organizer. Great. Well, today we're going to celebrate 30 years of the ADA on this show. We're going to talk to Cindy Tarshish, the program director for ADA Minnesota, Mai Thor from uh, Minnesota Department of Human Rights, and David Finley, the ADA director for the Minnesota Council on Disabilities. So it'll be kind of a nice dialogue. And uh, just like I just said, it's about 30 years ago since we've they implemented the ADA in Washington, D.C., and that was a big monumentous moment for the disabled communities. So. Uh, we're going to learn lots about that later today. So we hope you'll stay tuned to Disability Viewpoints because it's coming up next. Today my guest is Anita Cameron, the Director of Minority Outreach for Not Dead Yet, an organization opposing physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. She is also a community activist and organizer and has been involved with National Disability Rights Organization, ADAPT, for over 30 years. Thank you, Anita, for this interview. With the many different protests happening around the country against police brutality and racial injustice and the upcoming anniversary of the ADA, I wanted to learn more about accessibility in activism and your experiences as an activist with a disability. To start off, could you tell me some of your background and involvement in disability activism? Sure. Uh, first, thank you for having me. Um, totally honored. I am, um, once again, Anita Cameron, Director of Minority Outreach for Not Dead Yet. Um, I am 55 years old, um, and I think that's important to note. I'm originally from Chicago. I joined the, um, I started doing social justice work at 16. And then at 21, I joined the disability rights movement. I joined uh, ADAPT um, in uh, 1986 back in Chicago. As for access, well, I was spoiled, okay, because we were all folks with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, all of us, or the vast majority of us, were people with disabilities. So we made sure that in our uh, in our marches, in our protests, and whatnot, because we marched to our protests. That's just kind of the way we do it in ADAPT. So we made sure that we're taking accessible routes. So we always take the streets. Rarely, if ever, take the sidewalks. Probably maybe four or five times in the 34 years I've been involved with ADAPT that we actually take the sidewalk because the streets are more accessible and it's easier to um, make it accessible and have people on the lookout for things like cracks and rocks and grates and things like that. Um, we march slow because a lot of us are seniors, a lot of us are young, a lot of us have disabilities where um, we don't necessarily have the greatest control over our wheelchairs and other mobility equipment. So in order to keep people from being left way far behind, we you know, we regulate 
the speed at which we march. Oftentimes, um, other movements um, and whatnot, they really don't think about access. They don't even think about um, including us. And oftentimes, if we insist on being included, then we get pushback. Um, and that's a shame uh, because there is intersectionality. There are, you know, disabled people, you know, of, of color and, you know, who are involved in immigration issues and things of that nature who want to be able to get out there in the trenches in those um, movements and things that, that affect us, but we can't. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I guess, is there anything else you would want to say about maybe some of the differences you may have seen or some ways you've seen protests uh, that have been accessible or have not been accessible? The only time that we people with disabilities actually um, are able to participate in something is when we do it. So like, for instance, I believe it was June 6th, they had the uh, Disabled Black Lives Matter March in Washington, D.C. That was um, created by two Black disabled women who saw that the normal protests weren't including people with disabilities. So they set up an entire march for, um, uh, you know, for disabled folks. And now it's the only time that I've seen uh, people with disabilities being taken in account, you know, of being um, involved in the creation of and the execution of, you know, marches, protests, things like that. We have to take, and, and they didn't get permission from Black Lives Matter to do this. They took the permission and did it. And that's what we're going to have to do from now on because um, so many of these movements outside of the disability rights um, arena don't really accept us. Okay. And I know you've been involved in activism since before the passing of the ADA. Uh, have you seen any difference differences in the way people think about accessible activism since the passing of the ADA? There's been um, an effort to make sure that um, autistic and neurodivergent folks can participate. So I've seen um, protests in the disability movement where they have a place where um, like on certain marches, they have a place where you can kind of fall out of line and rest and join the line again. I'm excited about the, um, the things that people can do online, you know, here lately that we disabled um, weren't able to do before. I'm excited that people are giving respect now for people who are homebound and can't get out there in the streets and do protests and stuff like that, that um, people are doing activism from their beds, you know, because being able to get out there in the streets and the trenches, that really is a form of privilege. Um, and I acknowledge that privilege obviously in the age of COVID-19 um, we can't and so um, you know we're doing a lot of these things more online you know and whatnot um, what we're doing now would never have been thought of prior to the Americans with Disabilities Act never have been thought of what I'm hoping now um, that goes for is that those disabled folks who need to work from home or, um, you know, telecommute or do all of those things that jobs said could not be done. Those, those um, reasonable accommodations that they said could not be done. Now, because of COVID-19, we're proving that it can be done. We do the protesting to fight for stuff like 
work access and all of that, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's something a lot of people have been talking about lately is finding other ways to to do activism, such as um, online activism and things like that. This kind of platform, to me, this is the future. Um, this is the future of activism. Okay. It, 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 it really is. Zoom, Zoom has been around for a few years, but COVID made it just explode, you know, it, with usage and stuff. And once COVID goes, this type of activism and these types of meetings and things of that nature, that's not going to change. That's going to be, I think, even more prevalent. So we have to make sure that uh, that organizations outside of the disability community and arena are uh, making their making these, you know, meetings and things of that nature, making them accessible. And and what do you think organizers usually need to keep in mind in order to make activism accessible? In the first place, A, if you're not talking about disabled people, then they need to be including us in their conversations. We people with disabilities need to be involved in that. But first off, you need to see the value of including us, um, you know, in your work. Uh, because we disabled people, we we're we're not just disabled and that's it you know we care about issues as well that either affect us or that we're passionate about you know stop discriminating against us you know let us in this isn't a zero-sum game you know dealing with um equity and justice and accessibility and whatnot is not going to take away from you or your organization one bit. My hope and dream post ADA is that at one point, this stuff is going to be automatic. It should be automatic, like um, accommodations and you know access features and all that should be you know automatically a part of platforms like this and a part of uh, the work of any organization if you are truly interested in including um, everyone and equity, you know, and, and justice for everyone. Okay, well, well, thank you for sharing um, all of this, this great information. And um, is there anything else you would like to add at all? Happy ADA 30. And like I said, my my dream is that one day for everyone, it's going to become second nature to include access for people with disabilities in your platform. Um, that's, that's what my, what my dream is, is that one day we don't have to fight for our lives. We won't be seen as living a fate worse than death that, you know, we're, you know, going to be seen as disabled people as having lives worthy of living. And, um, you know, I've got this, you know, dream in my head and heart and soul that I'm going to keep working on, you know, until I am no longer on this plane. Yeah, well, thank you for coming on and taking the time to speak with me. Um, and, uh, I, I think this is going to be, um, you know, something that a lot of people will be thinking about uh, right now. So thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes. This is an important month in the disability community. July depicts the 30th anniversary of the American Disabilities Act. With me are three of my of uh, the very important people who administer and guide in the disability community, I think. And that's Cindy Tarshish, Program Director of the American ADA in Minnesota. And uh, Mai Thor with the um, Minnesota <laughs> Department of Human Rights. And David Finley from the Minnesota Council on Disabilities. Welcome. Cindy, I'd like to start with you first. And if you'd like to start with an open comment, that'd be great. 
Oh, thanks so much, Mark. I appreciate being here. I just want to say that in general, the ADA has really had a very positive uh, impact on the lives of people with disabilities. Um, as we know, clearly it's a civil rights legislation for people with disabilities. But what has been lacking um, over the past 30 years is the progress that we had hoped to make in Title I, which is the employment title. Right. Unfortunately, uh, the 2018 statistics um, state that only 27% of people with disabilities here in Minnesota have full-time employment. I was just sitting here thinking that even in good times, our employment for the disabled runs about 78%, 80 at the best. Um, with all the health issues that there are as far as the disabled and we really want people to work, um, how do you judge by the COVID? When is a good time to go back to? Well, you know, we have to go by what uh, our governor states is safe in which to do. Um, we have to, you know, look at where the, the curve is. Have we flattened the curve? Have we not flattened the curve? It depends what your profession is. Are you a teacher or are you somebody, you know, in the office? We have people, some of my calls have been, you know, individuals who are on MAEPD mm -hmm. and right now they're furloughed or laid off or have lost their job and they're very concerned that they're not gonna be able to uh, pay for their premium or even be able to stay on the uh, health benefit of MA, which is uh, not true. People will be able to stay on uh, the the MA and, and, and receive those benefits. And if they have any questions about that, they should absolutely call right. the Disability Hub at Man or other resources. Um, we have people who have gotten COVID-related raises uh, some of the big, the large department stores have done that. And then people who are on SSDI, all of a sudden they're bumped up. Uh, their earned income is right. over the amount that they're allowed to earn. Yeah. Um, so people are uh, nervous to go back to work if they have compromised health issues. Right. So employment aside, I just want to be able to get a push in and tell everybody, you know, what we're doing uh, for the ADA 30th celebration. We tentatively plan to offer it July 16th, 2021. And we're going to have Kevin Kling, Galen Lee, and our star is going to be Haben Gurma, uh, who um, Metro State University is helping us to bring in. And she is the first uh, deafblind individual to graduate Harvard Law School. Great. So if people want more information about that, I'd like to direct them to uh, our website, which is simply ada30mn.com. Or we're posting our events at other people's ADA celebrations on our Facebook page, which you could either go to ADA 30 Minnesota or at ADA 30 MN. All right. And then next we have Mai Thor, who is Community Engagement Coordinator for the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Welcome, Mai. Hey, Mark. Thank you for having me. Glad to have it's you. Always on. nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. Glad to have you on the show. Do you want to begin with an open comment? You can. Yeah, I wanted to talk about um, the ADA and focus on uh, the civil rights aspect of it uh, because it really was a, a fight um, for equality for people with disabilities um, to be recognized under the law. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to point that out. And I also wanted to point out that um, we have a law here in Minnesota called the Minnesota Human Rights Act, which has been um, around for about 50 years now and parallels the ADA in the protections that it provides uh, on behalf of people with disabilities um, because it prohibits discrimination based on um, disability as a protected class. And it's one of the strongest civil rights laws in the country, as I mentioned. And, um, you know, we know that we Minnesota has is becoming more and more racially diverse. And so um, we also want to point out that um, disability is uh, very intersectional, you know, including other races, national origin. Um, and that involves unconscious and conscious biases. Um, that prevent people with disabilities to be fully included. And so, um, you know, we want to look at that uh, through that lens as well when we're talking about ADA um, and achieving a discrimination-free Minnesota. I'm people. so proud and glad to hear of the work that you're doing. I mean, I knew it was going on, but I'm glad to hear you say it. I do want to uh, mention, if you have uh, experienced discrimination as a person with disability, um, I encourage you to call our department and we could help you. And our discrimination helpline is 1-833-454-0148. If somebody didn't have a pen or pencil at home, can you give that again? Sure. Uh, so our discrimination helpline is 1-833-454-0148. Um, 
454-0148 at the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Thanks for being on the show today. And next up, we have David Finley, who is the ADA Director for the Minnesota Council on Disabilities. Welcome, David. Hello. Thank there, you. There you and, are. Hi. And also, thank you, Cindy and Mai. Um, I'm going to focus on the portion of the ADA that, that looks at accessibility. Uh, right. Cindy talked about employment. And while employment numbers have really struggled to move over the last 30 years, accessibility is something that has improved over the last 30 years. Post the signing of the ADA, there was a big push, especially here in Minnesota. We created a, a state fund to, um, to make government and businesses more accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, that fell, fell to the wayside. Uh, accessibility wasn't as on the forefront as it was post-1990. Um, that changed in the last six years. About six years ago, we had some lawsuits come to Minnesota, which reinvigorated the discussion around physical accessibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the one thing I'm thinking of is I like to work, but you got to take vacations once in a while. The Minnesota Council on Disability did a lot of work with the parks and cabins and things like that uh, mm -hmm. when when Margaret and I Cross was uh, involved in it. Are you are you still working on that? But yeah, yeah, park accessibility is still moving forward. Um, we're looking to get uh, a, a pot of money for the Department of Natural Resources okay. um, to be able to focus specifically on accessibility in parks. So yes, that's something that we, we still work on. Um, our, our agency is tasked with really uh, being all things disability to the entire state of Minnesota, right. which isn't possible given the given constrained no. resources. Yeah. But we do like to focus on accessibility. That's something that, that we believe um, um, is, is, is a good place to invest resources. The ADA states that uh, government and businesses need to be accessible. Uh, that's Title II and Title III of the ADA. There's a higher responsibility on government given that it's taxpayer funded. Um, and here in Minnesota, when we look to technical standards, we look to we look to the building code mm -hmm. um, because our building code in Minnesota has incorporated uh, all of the technical specifications right. that are in the ADA and in some instances has gone above and beyond. And I did want to finish with uh, just a touch on digital accessibility. Mm -hmm. It's something that that is relatively new. Um, it wasn't it wasn't a thing when the ADA was passed in 1990. It's been around for. Um, over a decade now, um, but people don't know a lot about it. There aren't technical specifications in the ADA, but courts around the country have ruled that digital accessibility is in the spirit of the law. Right. So you are, businesses and government are responsible for having their websites be accessible. David, it, does that become more prevalent as we get through the COVID-19 epidemic and, and people work from home, you get the digital, but also accessibility as far as office space in your home sometime might become an issue? That's, that's, that's a really good question. And it, it is, is just yet another example of how uh, uh, technologies and how things that folks with disabilities be, bring to the mm -hmm. forefront um, eventually benefit everybody in society. Now right. that everybody's working from home, um, yes, you know, it was an accommodation before for people with disabilities working from home or being yeah. able to telework. Now everybody's teleworking, so it's, yeah. you know, people are finding ways to, to make things work, things that folks with disabilities have been doing for, I would say, centuries, adapting to a world that's not created uh, for them. I, I want to just get one final comment from everybody in case there's something we've missed on each of your given subjects. Thanks so much. Always happy to give a final thought. My final thought is, you know, let's take the time to celebrate our 30 years of, of equality uh, in celebrating the ADA on July 26. There's lots of virtual events. Uh, please check um, our Facebook websites uh, so that you can take advantage of those opportunities. I think they're going to be posted somewhere on the end of this uh, taping. So thank you. That sounds great. My Thor, final comment, something we've missed that you want to cover? You know, we all know that there's more work to be done because there's always work to be done. But I think um, for this year, you know, we really wanted to just celebrate what what's already happening right. um, in the disability community because there is so much happening, you know, with with our community and our, you know, people and our culture. So, um, yeah, I just I think I want to just echo that. Well, 
Thank you very much for being on here. David Finley, ADA Director, Minnesota Council on Disabilities. One last thought, that's something we forgot. Yeah, yeah, you know, 30 years is a long time. Um, one thing that I, that, that I would like to reiterate is the contributions that folks with disabilities have made to society. A lot of times they go unnoticed, even though it's technology we use every day, whether it's a curb cut or a door opener or text messaging on your phone. Um, these are things that uh, folks with disabilities don't necessarily get credit for. And I think general public doesn't realize uh, the depth with which um, people with disabilities have, have changed society. You don't realize the technologies or the curb cuts or the, the automatic door opening or anything like that that you have to use it. I mean, you know, it just goes on, it's just there, it goes unnoticed. And, and that's why there's the Minnesota Council on Disabilities and all these organizations that you folks work at to, in case people have questions, they want to learn more, they can get a hold of, of, one, of the, one of you fine, knowledgeable people. Thank you all for being on here today. And I guess my final comment would just be Thanks for the ADA, American Disabilities Act. It's an important feature in the disabled community. And everybody be safe at home and let's get through this COVID thing together. And thanks for watching Disability Viewpoints. We'll see you next time. Well, again, we want to uh, thank everybody for watching and, and uh, Mark this piece of history as the 30th anniversary of the American Disabilities Act, the day in July that really changed how the disabled uh, community was uh, uh, garnered into America as far as employment and a whole bunch of other uh, things that it covers. So it's a big piece of history, and we hope we've had uh, explained some of it here on the show. Uh, we want to thank everybody at home for watching. We want to thank Imani Cruzen for uh, co-hosting today and uh, we hope we brought out some important points of the American Disabilities Act that was implemented 30 years ago and uh, unfortunately that we couldn't have any celebration here this year because of COVID-19 but uh, we, we tried to put together a little Zoom interview program so we could bring out some of the important points of the Americans with Disabilities Act itself and I'd like to thank my guest uh, Cindy Tarshish from ADA Minnesota, Mai Thor from Minnesota Department of Human Rights, and David Finley, the ADA Director for the Minnesota Council on Disabilities. I'm on, do you have a few words you wanna add before we go? Yeah, I want to uh, thank you for having me on and thank you to Anita Cameron for speaking with me about accessibility and activism. And a happy birthday to you, Mark, from everyone at Disability Viewpoint. <laughs> so those of you that didn't know now, you do know now, and thank you for that, and I'll see you soon, Imani. Take care, everybody. Bye for now, and thanks for watching Disability Viewpoints.